hacking. Welcome to webdevcourses.tv. My name is Mark Tejas and I'll be your instructor. And welcome to modern web development. Introduction to modern web development, we could say. It looks like my camera is frozen. Let me fix that. Interesting. It's always funny how it freezes in the, in the most interesting ways. This should fix it. Let's see. Are you going to come back, camera? Are you going to come back? Is my camera not on? Is it not on? Got to turn it off at night. Remember your job was to turn that on? Let me just take a second. Okay, we've got it now. Why are you moving everything? You can't do it here. Put it on the buttons and it's going to... All right. Sorry about that. Another false start. Good morning. <laughs> so the camera wasn't on. All righty. We are doing modern web development today. And that's what we got here. Doing introduction to modern web development. We talked about some of the history of where, um, where the web was. Like, why do we need this thing called modern web development in the first place? We talked about that. Um, today we're going to show some of the reasons, uh, some of the problems with the old web and how the, the new web or modern web development solves these problems. At 11 a.m., we're going to be doing vanilla JavaScript for beginners. 11.30, we're going to have JavaScript interview questions and answers. At 12 p.m., we're going to be doing designing UX using Tailwind CSS. Let me take a break. We come back at 7 p.m., and then it's databases and cred. We're going to continue on MongoDB. And then at 8 p.m., we're going to do building an RPG game using JavaScript. And, um, yeah, that's the schedule for today. These are all basically U.S. Central times. It's actually Mexico City time, but it's basically the same as Chicago and Dallas, at least, uh, at least right now. At least right now at this time. With this time zone and, you know, all that good stuff. Okay, so, intro to modern web development. We need to talk about what didn't work so we can talk about what does work. So let's create a folder called old. This is the way that it used to be done. You would have a folder called like IMG. And you'd have a folder called CSS. And you'd have a folder called JS. And then you'd have a bunch of HTML files. Now, the HTML file, uh, HTML5, even though... Actually, no, I guess not. Because HTML5 would not be the, the, the part of the, the web I'm talking about. Okay, so you had a head tag, you had a body tag. Your head tag would include uh, a link to your style sheets. So this would be like uh, probably forward slash because we'd be running this as a web developer or as a uh, web server from this root. So it'd be forward slash CSS slash style CSS. And there'd be a bunch of these. So maybe this would be typography. And we need a closing tag on that. So you had typography, you'd have colors, you'd have a whole bunch of different CSS. Um, maybe there is something in here for ads. And maybe there's something else here for uh, responsive. So you got like four style sheets. You could put the script tag up here. But generally what we did was we put the script tag down here in the body, which would force the HTML to load first. Let me get rid of one of the, or all of those, but one. Let's name it uh, styles.css. All 
I don't know, we'll just put a body tag on there or something. We'll say background color RG B A two let's see uh zero comma zero comma zero comma zero point two five something something like that okay so we're gonna have font size 16 pixels which is going to set our rem settings basically uh we're gonna have some javascript in here let's actually put the javascript right here first also i'm about to get this running on the new version of uh the preview the built-in browser extension from microsoft is really really pissing me off <clears throat> they used to let you just right click and run from the folder and they have changed something and i can't do that anymore it's driving me crazy let's see prettier live preview i hate switching to something like pre-release but they appear to have taken away some functionality that i used to have and i used to want and now it's not here yeah i could do this show preview see here's the problem is that it's going from this folder and i don't want it to go from that folder now what it's telling me is that i have to like open up vs code brand new from here and not have all this folder structure <laughs> that's just stupid all right fine we're going to have to open mark Flash, where are we? We are on Intro to Modern Development, Day 2, Old. All right. Try this preview again. Now we're actually previewing from the right place. I don't know why they took that away. You used to be able to just set what you wanted. Uh, I need a Firefox, don't I? Got to be on the right window, too. All right, so we got our website. We've got our HTML. We've got some JavaScript here. Make this a uh, 90. And we're gonna have to do color white or something else so that we actually can see it on our dark background. Okay, so H1, hello world. All right, so this is what you get. So first thing to notice is that the uh, there's there's default styles here. I didn't say to set this to send or to a serif. It's being set to serif by the browser. Um, there's box sizing issues that we have to fix. There's uh, there's all kinds of stuff that we have to fix. So what we have to do is we have to get a CSS reset file. Now this one is sort of famous. So I'm going to use that one. This is sort of the one that got us to where we're at. And let's just put that, let's put, a, let's create a reset file. So create a new one called reset.css. Put our reset in there. Copy pasty. Reset. And now all, well, I don't know if all the styles are gone, but most of the styles are gone. So Hello World has no, no styling. It's crammed over there on the left. Okay. Now, again, what we're doing here is we're building, a, we're going to build a simple web page the way that we used to build it so that you can see the difference between what was classical web development and what's considered modern web development. Until you've seen some of the ugliness of the old stuff the new stuff won't be as cool like kids that are raised today with with devices they don't have any idea what it's like to play outside without a device they don't have any idea what it's like to climb trees chase wild animals uh go in the woods and go hunting at like nine years old or ten years old with your friends like that stuff is just it's lost it's gone forever and I feel that uh, you have the same issue with like classic web development. It's gone forever, so nobody remembers what it was like 
And therefore you don't really understand like why do you have the tools that you have? Why did we why did we end up where we ended up? I think honestly, I think that's I guess I can suck on that while I'm talking. I have a, uh, a fixation with toothpicks ever since I read uh what's the name of that movie? It's by Stephen King. Uh Dreamcatcher, where the aliens come down and my favorite character was Beaver. Beaver was always chewing on a toothpick, at least until he died on the toilet. Chewed apart by a shit weasel. <clears throat> All right, Stephen King. Yeah. Uh, so let's see, we have a script here. Why do we put the script at the bottom? Let's say that we're going to change this H1 tag. Let's put the script where it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be in the head. So let's say we got document... Dot, uh, get, uh, let's do query, query selector. And we're going to grab the first H1 that we see. Technically, you're only supposed to have one H1. I guess I'll have to use a var since I'm simulating the old shit. Um, so our H1 is document.query selector. Uh, actually, I don't think query selector was there either. I think we would have to do like get by ID, but this is fine. So, uh, dot style dot font size I had to put in brackets because of the uh, the hyphen in the name and I want to say actually I guess you could do uh, you could just do the whole style string so let's set the style to this let's say that it is a uh, font size uh, six rem. So when we, we look at it, nothing's happening. Why is nothing happening? Why is H1 null? Oh, H1's null because this loads and then this loads. Ah, well, we can fix that. We can just take this out of the head and take it out of where it's supposed to be, put it where it's not supposed to be, and then it works. But this is the band aid. This is definitely not how you want to do it. And the reason is, is that we've, we've come into uh, tags like async, or not async, um, defer. We've come into tags, I don't, do I have to do a true? I always just put the keyword defer, but I think that's because I'm using React and there's a convention that handles that. So we generally defer scripts. Also scripts can be loaded asynchronously from other places. Also, we don't really load scripts like this anymore. We use Webpack. We create bundles that have essentially all of the uh, the HTML re or the JavaScript ready for the web because you can't that JavaScript that you're using where you're typing import and you're typing require you can't do that in the browser. None of that stuff works in the browser. So we're used to all this you know import this thing, require that thing. None of that works in the browser. So in the browser, you can't really separate all your files out the way that, that we like. They all have to be included in their own script tag, which means that the context between them are all like disconnected. So that's why we use something like Webpack that'll build up all of our stuff, and then we can have requires and stuff. But for here, we don't have that. We just don't, we don't have the technology. Okay, so what if we were going to move this back up to here where it belonged? We're back to this problem. Um, how will we get around this? Well, you got the window object, right? And the window object has uh, some event listeners, right? We're going to add an event listener for DOM content loaded. When this returns true, or when this callback fires, I should say, when this event fires, uh, everything on the page is loaded. So if we just put our code there, everything works again. Because we're not going to be getting a null value from this. By the way, what happens if you don't want nulls in your code? Because I don't like nulls in my code. If we take off this stuff again, we paste it again. Now you can see that H1 is undefined. Undefined is incredibly more useful than null. Null is saying it exists, but it doesn't have a value, which is that will lead you to terrible programming. That'll lead you to imperative thinking and just garbage programming. 
what you want is to make sure that you're returning things with undefined. Undefined, unlike null, will not break keyword parameters. It doesn't break default arguments. It, null is garbage, basically. Don't use it. Just use undefined. If you need to make something undefined because the, the, the base API returns null, just do or undefined. <clears throat> okay, so now we can change our stuff like this, but this is not very useful. Um, what if we wanted something like have our H1 cycle through colors? This is very, very early web days where we did horrible, horrible things. All right, so let's see. Let's have a uh, blue, red. Actually, let's go through the colors. So red, pink. From pink, it would go to what? Purple, would it? From red to pink would be that we're including, yeah, some blue. So it would go to purple. And then it would go to blue. And then it would go to green. And then it would go to yellow. And there's, there's other colors here. I'm just going to work with these ones. So what if we wanted to like cycle through this and keep changing the color? We have this set interval. Let's call it off the window object. We've got set interval. Set interval will take a function. That function will fire each time the timeout is reached. Let's give it a timeout of a second. So what we could do now is we could say um, h1 dot style equals and we could give it a style and we're like, okay, um, we want the color of the text to change. We want it to be a new value. Ah, but we can't do, can't do stuff like this in the old JavaScript. So we put this base in and then we concatenate it with a plus and we would do something like colors. Let's just do it the index of I for now, which doesn't exist. So let's say, uh, var i equals zero. So we're going to set the colors to the color. Then we need to also concatenate the string again, because we're going to need to put quotes in this around our color. And then we're going to need a semicolon. So you can see how like, this gets really ugly really fast, which is why we have string templates now. All right, so color, colors. How do I know if this is working or this is not working? Let's put a console log in it. And we'll just print off colors I for now. Okay, so we get red. Okay, so color, color, red. Didn't do it. Let's hard code it for a minute. Color, red. Maybe it doesn't have the quotes. It doesn't have the quotes. So we'll get rid of these extra quotes. And now you got red. It'll cycle the pink. And then it'll cycle the purple. Not cycling. Red. Oh, I haven't, I haven't done the cycle part yet. So we can do I++, right? That's going to show red, and it's going to increment it once. So we got the colors, the colors are just alternate through, right? And then at the end, we're back to the beginning because we've gone out of index. So what we might want to do is something like, well, if that I is greater than colors dot length minus one, we would just set I back to zero. <clears throat> and now it should cycle through and then it should repeat. We got one undefined. Pink, purple, blue, green, yellow, red, or pink. 
Wait, we got rid of red now. Actually, yeah. Blue, green, yellow, undefined, pink. Where is my red, actually? Red is the first one. We're doing a plus plus. How about we do a plus plus I? Let's switch that around. Okay, so now plus plus I is going to start us off at one. We don't want that. We want to start off with I. If I is greater than colors.length, which shouldn't, we should get red. How come it doesn't? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It doesn't print it out because it's already changed. Let's go back to here. Let's put that first. That's what's going on. Now we got a red. Now we got our pink, purple, blue, green, yellow, red. Undefined. This is the, uh, the nature of imperative programming. Off by one errors are the standard. Yellow, red. Okay, so we got rid of the undefined. So now we just cycle through these, right? Now I want you to imagine if we had a lot more code here, right? What if our code started to look like this? All right, so here's your HTML file now. This is what the web used to look like. This is how everything was. It was a nightmare. You'd have thousands of lines of CSS in a file. You'd have thousands of lines of JavaScript in a file. And it was just a mess. It's just an absolute mess. Okay, so how will we make this less messy? Okay, well, the first thing is, is why don't we just cut that out? Let's create ourselves a JavaScript file. Index.js is fine. We're just going to paste that in. Um, this is going to run immediately. When we load it. So let's say script src equals forward slash js index.js because we're not using a loader. We have to type out the whole thing. And everything still works. Still doing the cycling thing. Okay, cool. Uh, what if we wanted to put this in a function, right? Like what if we wanted to be like, this is called cycle colors. So I'm gonna create a function called cycle colors. We'll just put that code in there. What happens now? Okay, it's still running, so we're still good. <clears throat> Why does this work when this happens first and this happens second? We haven't defined this, so how could it happen here? The answer is hoisting happens. So that happens behind the scenes automatically where your function is moved to the top. That's why your function is now available here. Also, this event listener is waiting for the event to come back as DOM content loaded. Then it fires this. So by the time that that has happened, this has already been instantiated. Newer things with JavaScript plus uh, like use strict. The whole point of these things was to remove this ambiguity where it's like you're not sure if it's hoisted. If it's not hoisted, what scope the thing is in. How is, uh, how is var going to you know, deal with your lexical scoping? Because here's the thing, with var, if I create a var here, I can use the var inside of here, right? I can say foo equals two. If I specify who is here, we can still get access to it just like you would think. But what if we had like a switch case? The switch statement is supposed to be able to go through cases and say when it's one, do something. Uh, console.dir1 and then break. Or what I generally do is I move this inside of a function and I call a return. Okay, so this is all fine. Um, what happens if you define it in here? Would we be able to get it outside? Would you be able to say console.dir foo? Let's call it. So we get a one. We shouldn't have gotten a one. If we switch this to a let, we get a one. 
Okay. What happens if we take this thing and we move it up to here? Now we're inside, well, can't put it there. Now we're inside of our function. Read declaration of foo. Let's get rid of that. Oh, I didn't realize I had that in two places. Okay, so now it says foo not defined, which is what we're expecting. However, if we do this, we get undefined. Like it just, it doesn't undefined. It doesn't actually break it. It doesn't give us an error. It's just returning it as undefined. Doesn't have a problem. If you switch this to let, suddenly you have a problem again. Reference error. This is why we don't use var. Var doesn't listen to scoping. Var just does whatever it wants. FN is not the farm. Let's get rid of FN. We don't need it no more. Okay. No more errors. So we've got an HTML file. It's got a couple of CSS. We've got a reset. We've got a styles. We've got this. What happens if we want another JavaScript file? Like say maybe we want something else. We want, um, I don't know, <clears throat> else.js. New file, else.js. Inside of here, we have something like... Uh, let foo equals one. And we want that value over here. How do you do that? Well, the way we used to do it, <laughs> don't do this, is we say, okay, we'll just stick it on the, the, the global. If you stick it on the global, it's available everywhere. So let's see, can we do console.dir window.foo? Oh, we can print out our one. So the way to get around like having multiple files that don't share context was like, just stick it on the global object. Bad, bad idea. Don't stick things on the global object unless you absolutely have to. <clears throat> so we don't do that anymore, but that means that you can't have multiple files like this. This is where Webpack comes in. Webpack is going to allow us to do common JS requires so that we can just have like one import and that import imports all the other stuff. And then we have like this happy family of, of shared context. But you don't get that in the old web. You just don't get it. Oh man, my neck is bad. I slept wrong. Anybody got any questions so far about scoping rules or anything else? Jean-Pierre, welcome. He says uh, normalized CSS is his favorite to use. Uh, Jeremiah says hoisting, and it's because it's scoped to the function. Well, sort of. It's because var doesn't var just doesn't behave. It doesn't listen to the, the scoping rules. Var was created before the scoping rules were created. Else or uh, let and cons will follow the, the appropriate scoping. If you put it in a block, if you put let i equals one here, it will not get hoisted up to here at runtime. If you do a var inside of a block, it will get pulled out and hoisted up. That's the difference between the two. Var is always hoisted and let and cons will only hoist depending on the rules. Like they're gonna go up to the next, the, the, we'll go up to the first set of braces. But they're not going to go outside of those braces. And if you put on use strict, like, you don't get hoisting at all, I think. Pretty sure use strict gets rid of hoisting completely. I never let hoisting happen. I always just do, put the stuff where I want it myself. Yeah, hoisting only will be avoided with let, but it won't happen with var. With var, it'll, it'll still just hoist up however the hell it wants. With modern let, it's going to hoist up to, it says there, it says like the nearest function, but that's not true. It's going to hoist itself up to the, the set of curly braces that it belongs to. So if we did like, you know, var foo equals one, we got a bunch more code, var, var equals two. Because they're vars, they're going to get pushed up to here. But if you got strict mode on and you got a let, it won't happen. It'll just stay down here where it's at. And if you call it up here before, it'll say, hey, you're calling something before you initialized it, which is how every other language on the planet works, just not JavaScript. 
Hey man, JavaScript had JavaScript had the first real problems to solve for quite a while because C solved real problems and after that it was just let's see how many different versions of toys we could make with it. JavaScript solved a real problem, which was asynchronous web communication. Uh, web interactivity, I should say. Elm, Erlang, Erlang. Erlang was an interesting language because it solved a very specific problem. Erlang is used on like telephone switches around the world. And Erlang can handle a ridiculous amount of like input output per second, per millisecond. It's, it's incredibly fast. So I like languages that had to solve an interesting problem. And JavaScript qualifies. JavaScript certainly qualifies. And it has to be backward compatible basically forever, which sucks. And they didn't get everything right the first time. So the language gets messier and messier as we go on, but only if you try to use everything. If you just start throwing away the old stuff and stick with the new stuff, uh, I don't have any trouble myself. Do I debug? Absolutely, I debug. I debug a lot. Um, debugging is part of programming. Your debugging is going to be relative to the, the amount of years that you have in like learning patterns, writing clean code will reduce the amount of debugging you do, but it's never going to get rid of it. You're still going to have to debug. And if you're like me and you're kind of shitty at math, You'll have to solve your math bugs manually by not doing calculations, not doing arithmetic, but just like printing stuff out to the screen and being like, okay, did that number get bigger? Did that number get smaller? What time is it? It is uh, 9.32. So we've done our half hour here. I want to take this to Webpack. I don't have time, I think, to take it to Webpack and explain what the process is to move something like this into Webpack in the time that we have. Um, so I think I'll pick this up actually on Monday, especially since like it's Turkey Day. It's the day after Turkey Day. I'm sure everybody's tired and half the people are half asleep. So yeah, let's end this here and we'll pick it up again on Monday. And uh, we're going to do the Webpack stuff on Monday. So I'm happy to report that the channel health is increasing, my friends. Thank you so much for, for your support. That's really what, what does this. The channel stays healthy when, uh, well, when people are, are helping out. Actually, I can't see this anymore with that scale. Let me make it bigger. Why are you on there? Or I want you. Get over here. Get over here. Okay. Uh, we're up to 207 on YouTube. This is awesome. Look, I had 15,000. And then I got rid of that channel. Because I know that there's like shadow bands and stuff on it. There's something that is definitely preventing it from growing. So in experiment time, we start a brand new channel, which is the channel that you're watching. We're up to 207. That's pretty cool. We got 39 on Twitch, which means that we're getting very close to uh, uh, affiliate partnership, something like that. I don't know exactly how Twitch works, but I know that I got a message saying congratulations. And basically just a week, you're going to qualify for affiliate or whatever it is. So I'm going to thank Thomas Lawrenson. And Chris Loggins for giving us tips. By the way, that tip jar link essentially goes to support my wife. It's basically my wife's mark is no longer around fun. That's pretty much what the tip jar is. The money that goes in the tip jar will go to pay for like the, the, the SSD that we had to buy to get the show back up and running. Um, but really, mostly, honestly, uh, it's just a, it's a safety nest for my wife when I'm no longer here. Uh, let me check something on Stripe to see if we got any new donations that I need to shout out because, I mean, if it wasn't for that, I'm not sure what we would be doing. Where's my login button? Oh, I don't want to create a Stripe account. I have a Stripe account. I just want to log in. I got to hide it. We got to hide it, Stripe. Your modal is not accessible. All right, let me see. What's going on here? Payments. What do we got? Okay, I want to thank whoever is in Recount, Recount Zebra. Thank you so much for the donation. Thank you again, Chris, for donating again. Look, they're $2. They're $1. Chris gave us $10. That's pretty amazing. 
$2, $10, $1. It doesn't matter to me because it's all times 20 when you turn it into Mexican peso and that's what takes care of my wife should something happen to me. So yeah, that's the fun for the wife and kids. And uh, I will see you guys very soon. Like in a couple of minutes, we're going to be doing vanilla JavaScript for beginners at the top of the hour. I hope everybody had a happy Thanksgiving. I hope everybody... Uh, share time with their families your families are probably not as terrible as you might make them seem out to be they're probably nice people you should go talk to them